How do you think it's stacking up right now in terms of that moment? And you, and you isolated it, and you're, I think you're exactly right. What was in his mind, the moment that he was approached by the victim in this case and made the decision to shoot him? What do you think has been established so far by these uh, eyewitnesses? Compelling arguments on both sides, honestly. But the more that I hear this testimony, the more that I um, follow this case, the more that I'm buying into the defense and I'm seeing what the defense is putting on. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of facts that go both ways. And in self-defense cases, the ultimate fact is, um, you know, did he reasonably believe that his life is under apprehension? And I think that there is a lot there to show for it, right? He's a cyclist. He's not in another car. He's being followed. He's being driven off the road. Um, um, right. Um, and ultimately, um, you know, his first encounter wasn't a gun. It wasn't a shot. It was a punch. And how uh, appropriate that was, that's another discussion. But there's a lot here, um, you know, re leading up to this this moment, even though it's split seconds. Um, and ultimately, you know, uh, um, it, it, there are there are strong facts on both sides. But really, the defense, they, they have a good case and they need to be able to close this out. Yeah, I, I, as we've said many, many times, it's going to depend on this, this defendant. He's taken the stand in his own defense. And what's interesting about self-defense cases, and we're talking about what the, you know, this strong case uh, so far that the defense is putting on, <clears throat> dynamics sort of shift in a self-defense case, right? Especially when you put the defendant on the stand. They don't have a burden of proof. That, that doesn't change. But dynamics sort of shift a little bit in what this jury expects, especially when a defendant takes the stand. Absolutely. I mean, we've even discussed it, right? Taking the stand, the consistency there, the, um, you know, the statistics showing that, um, you know, the likelihood of even acquittal, um, if he was to do that, um, all, all indicate towards it. But in a self-defense case, um, everyone wants to know, what were you thinking? And even even the prosecutor um, in, in, in ex parte argument, um, you know, said, unless the defense could really put on an expert, you know, for the state of mind of the defendant, and they don't need to, they could just put on the defendant, let's hear his state of mind then and there, um, you know, and how credible is that going to stack up with everything else presented to Barr at this point? Yeah, we heard they're going to bring in a use of force expert. What do you think he might add to the case? Well, uh, maybe we'll pick and point certain factors and be able to show um, that it was reasonable um, that he thought his life was under apprehension, that, um, you know, that um, the, the moments leading up to this, um, you know, what, what is the amount of reason that the jury should really be thinking? And um, ultimately, uh, when he pulled that trigger, that, that's a really big moment to hone in on. And I think that that use of force expert could really narrow it in for this jury. Yeah, and I think, you know, these things come down to small details. And there was a little part of the testimony there from one of the eyewitnesses. The young man in the jumpsuit had gotten arrested because he wasn't cooperating. Um, he said that uh, the defendant seemed to turn and try to go down the stairs and then guess figured he couldn't. I guess he had his bike and everything else. And then he turned back, and that's when the shot happened. I think that might be important as well. The fact that he maybe was contemplating getting away, knew that he couldn't get away, and ultimately did what he thought he had to do. All right, Matthew, stand by. It is time for a break right now. When we come back,